Hello everybody and welcome to another Detail Diatribe where today we are talking about one villainous scene looking at the Battle of Dracula's Castle from Netflix's Castlevania, a show that unambiguously rules. Ah, oh, so good. Uh, and this is part of a collaboration with our buddy Nando V Movies, uh, who is running this one villainous scene collab. He's done one excellent scene in the past, which we uh, contributed to. He's done one marvelous scene and many other such projects. Uh, so he's got a playlist of a ton of other videos by other YouTube contributors uh, who are making cool things like this. So check it out if you want to see more. But with that established, Red, let's talk about Castlevania oh, and let's. how good of a villain Dracula is in this show. Oh my god, this show, this show, it's so good. So the fundamental premise of the show uh, is it's based off of the the old Konami video games uh, of you know various people trying to trying to fight a uh, big old bad guy Dracula. Yep. At the beginning of this show, Dracula's wife, a woman named Lisa, who is a doctor, Lisa of Lupu, now Lisa Tepesh, mm. uh, is killed for being a witch. And Dracula swears revenge against all of humanity and wants to destroy them. Yep. Um, an understandable reaction. Uh, yeah, a reaction so understandable that the show's hero explicitly sympathized with it when he's told <laughs> what it is. He's like, why is Dracula on the warpath? And they're like, oh, the church burned his wife as a witch. And he just says, shit, which is like, yeah, correct response, Trevor. <laughs> Yeah, so the main characters uh, on the human side, or not the human side, but on the uh, protagonist side are guys, Trevor Belmont, yeah. mm -hmm. the last of a famous line of vampire hunters, Saifa Belnadis, uh, a speaker magician, and Alucard, uh, Adrian Tepesh, uh, the son of Dracula and Lisa. So these three, they assemble the team uh, in season one, and season two is them going to, to fight and kill Dracula to stop his war against humanity. But what is so interesting about this show is the way in which Dracula is characterized over the course of season one, and especially in season two, leading up to the big confrontation between our heroes and Dracula at the Battle of Dracula's Castle at the very end of the season. So, Red, let's work our way through this season, uh, specifically season two, mm. towards this big confrontational moment and explain just how well Dracula is characterized. Right. Okay, so one thing that is important to know about this show is that the very first scene is Dracula's introduction, basically. Like, it, it's not pretending, oh, we're focusing on the heroes or anything. We don't start with any of our protagonists. We start with Lisa marching up to Dracula's castle, hammering on the door with the handle of her knife, and basically asking him to teach her about science because she wants to be a better doctor. And uh, Dracula is just as baffled by this as most of the audience probably is. <laughs> um, but, uh, and he keeps, you know, he's doing his Dracula thing. He's being intimidating. He's growling a little. He's saying, oh, I do not get many visitors. And she's just like, well, I can see why. You're not a very good host. Take my coat. Feed me tea. And he's like, uh-oh, I think I like this one. Which is just <laughs> so sweet. Like, you, you know my general thoughts on romantic subplots. This is a really, really good one. It sells you on it immediately. You completely buy that these two uh, have really fun chemistry and that they're going to have a really sweet relationship. And then the next thing we see is Lisa being burned at the stake, which is kind of a mood killer. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. So <laughs> you see just how how vile the people of the city of Tago Vista are being to Dracula's wife. And when Dracula appears in the sky as a giant flaming meteor face, <laughs> uh, you sympathize with him pretty strongly. Yeah. So for the entirety of this first episode and then leading through the first season, you see Dracula waging a war to essentially destroy humanity and you can't help but see where he's coming from and feel sad for the guy and yeah. feel a little bit of agreement <laughs> where he's, uh, whoa, what, what his goal is here. It's a very, it's, it's a very interesting space for the audience. Yeah. And it's a very interesting space to have your villain start off with a stock protagonist motivation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, the framing of Dracula from the very beginning is very interesting. Like, we know he's Dracula. He's the bad guy. Like, his visual design doesn't pull any punches. He's like nine feet tall, big black cape, red eyes, claws, evil goatee. He's classic villain looking. But... The way they characterize him, and even the way he's acted, is like there's there's a softness under there. There's a humanity. Uh, I have this this thesis in my notes that Dracula's only weakness is that he is not as big of a monster as he thinks he is. Everything else, he's yes. terrifyingly powerful. He's ridiculously strong. He is, in all senses, the motherfucking Dracula that he should be. But he has a heart, and that is. A problem, but uh, the show goes out of its way to start us off there. They don't start us off with like a villain song and then show us a little bit of sympathy later. No, from the very beginning, his motivation is heroic. Like, okay, they they took his wife, 
They they burned her at the stake f- for doing nothing wrong, just trying to help people. And a uh, fun fact, as she is being killed, she's trying, like Dracula's not there, but she's kind of yelling into the sky like he can hear her. And basically it's, Dracula, spare them, they know not what they do. <laughs> In case you were wondering yeah. the moral framing of Lisa, uh, she is probably the most unconditionally good person in the entire show and they kill her. And uh, Dracula uh, manifests a big flaming face and basically is like, the f*** did you do? All right, you have one year to get your affairs in order and then I'm killing all of you. And the people of Targovishta are like, he was probably joking. (laughs) And then one year later, they celebrate the one year anniversary of murdering his wife. And he uh, punches down out of the skies a big flaming face and he rains uh, an army of demons on Targovishta and kills, I'd say, 95% of everyone. Um, Yeah. But then uh, he doesn't stop there. Initially, initially, his revenge is a little bit more, I won't say understated, but his scope definitely expands. Uh, one thing it's we- It's proportional at first. It is. Tagavishta killed his wife, so he kills Tagavishta, but then it accelerates and expands yeah. wildly. One thing that's, that is interesting is we actually do get a glimpse of one of our protagonists at this point, because when Dracula is getting his affairs in order, setting up his army of the dead, you know, for, for the one year later thing, uh, a character who we later learn is Alucard basically tells him, I'm not going to let you do this. You can't do this. Look, if you want revenge, we'll just find the guy who did it and kill him, which is a very heroic thing to say. <laughs> uh, Alucard. Uh, but basically, he's like, I'm not going to let you do this. And Dracula uh, injures him badly enough that he spends a year recovering under a city. We'll find that out later. But, you know, basically the point is they they both want revenge. They both miss Lisa. But... Dracula has concluded that all of humanity needs to pay because, specifically, Dracula's idea is that there may have been innocents before, but now there are no innocents because any one of those people could have stood up and said, this is wrong and we're not going to do it anymore. Uh, This is an interesting thesis because it is mirrored by our protagonist Trevor later, but we will get to that. Dracula's thesis is that all of humanity is now culpable because nobody stopped them. Basically, the the worst of humanity won out, and that means they've lost their right to live. So his plan goes from kill Targovishta to kill all of Wallachia to kill the entire world. Uh, so, so Dracula, you know, he's in this weird place. Like, we we understand where he's coming from. The show goes out of its way to not get us on his side, but show us his perspective and to make sure that, like, mm-hmm. even the people opposing him understand his perspective. Alucard is like, I get it, but you gotta stop. Trevor has pretty much the exact same worldview as Dracula for a while. Uh, we haven't even met him yet. We'll get there. Oh, boy. Um, and this produces an odd framing because Dracula is one of the archetypical pure evil villains. And... In the games, he is kind of the ultimate final boss. You know, he's the guy at the other end of an army of minions sitting on a throne chucking wine glasses. He's that archetype. And it's interesting that they frame him in such a sympathetic light to begin with. But then we move on. We take the camera off of Dracula for a while. For most of season one, we are predominantly following the heroes as the gang gets together. You know, we get their characters. Dra- uh, Trevor starts off as a very beaten down, like he he's... Uh, he's very disillusioned. His entire family was basically killed when he was like 12, and his family is monster hunters that try and protect people and help them, and they were killed for being heretics. You may note this is exactly the same thing that happened to Lisa. Trevor is pretty <laughs> butthurt about this. Yeah. He's not very pleased. Uh, he's very disgruntled. He He's still like a badass, but he's also, you know, he's depressed, he's drunk. Uh, he is described by a uh, an old wise character, who we are supposed to assume is right, uh, as defeated by holding the worldview that humanity doesn't really deserve to be helped or saved, which is, as we've noticed, the worldview that Dracula has. And the fact that this worldview is being framed as already defeated is interesting. And Trevor gets his act together. He decides, never mind, you know what? I'm not afraid of death. I'm just afraid of not helping. So he gets his act together. He chucks off his cloak and uh, kind of just illustrates that while Dracula's worldview may be sympathetic, Trevor's worldview is objectively correct. And this sets up some of the ideological conflict that we're going to be seeing for season two. So speaking of defeated, when we cut back to Dracula, the very beginning of season two starts off showing again in gruesome detail the process of Lisa being burned for being a witch. uh, And then on her pyre, it cuts to Dracula's fireplace and we see him just staring at the fire completely depressed. Yeah. He, it's been a year he all of the anger has left him he is just sad and per the words of the character in season one he is defeated when we pick back up with him again in season two and this is where he starts and continues on his trajectory for most of the season it is a hard 
switch from where we saw him last, but it is completely in keeping with the the core of his motivation that without Lisa now all of all of life everything is is just pointless and the only thing that he wants the only thing that he needs is for humanity to pay so he is still single-mindedly in his pursuit that all humans have to die but the spark's not there anymore mm -hmm. it's it's an <laughs> obligation now he uh he describes short, it yeah. yeah he describes it at one point as a necessity uh one thing that's interesting about the way Dracula is framed in season two is that he he still has his gravitas. You know, he's com he's commanding an army of creatures of the night. He's got all his vampire lieutenants lined up. He's still playing Dracula in public, but you know, in all his private moments, he's just slumped in that chair, staring at the fireplace, uh, basically having quiet conversations with the only person he considers a friend, Isaac, one of his. Um, human uh, lieutenants who basically helps make the creatures of the night that he needs to use to kill everybody. What's interesting about that is that while, while he considers Isaac a friend, Isaac kind of can't see Dracula as a peer. He sees him as like his, you know, on this pedestal, his master, his this yeah. incredible, this this ancient mind with so much knowledge that humanity can't possibly match. And Dracula just wants to, you know, hang out and chat and stuff. and. This just kind of contributes to Dracula's feeling of isolation. Uh, there's only a couple points in the beginning, or in the first, I'd say, two thirds of season two, where Dracula seems to be a little bit roused from his uh, his torpor, and one of them is when uh, Isaac mentions to the room full of lieutenants that uh, a squad of protagonists appears to have assembled and is <laughs> starting to cause trouble for them. And when he mentions that Alucard is there, Dracula visibly reacts. And when he mentions that he's also got a Belmont with him, Dracula couldn't give less of a f but everybody else in the room freaks out. Uh, yes, which helps exactly. kind of inform us that Dracula is not worried about winning because the Belmonts are like monster hunters. Every other vampire in the room knows and fears them. So does really, Dracula knows them. He doesn't fear them. Dracula fears nothing. But the point is, you know, if Dracula were worried about the tactics of the situation, he might take steps to try and stop them or prevent them from getting all their crazy powerful magic weapons out of the Belmont hold and stuff like that. Dracula doesn't do any of that. The only time that that happens is when another one of the vampires, Carmilla, acts without his knowledge. To, because she's actually concerned about the tactics of the situation. Yeah, the only reason that, that Dracula cares that Alucard is potentially on the scene is because Alucard presents a thematic and philosophical counter to Dracula in the way that Trevor presents a tactical and strategic counter to Dracula in the eyes of the rest of the court. And that's yeah. what Dracula is scared of. It's not anything material. It's the thought that someone is specifically in a fundamental psychological and philosophical opposition to what he wants. And the only other time that we really see Dracula get angry and get out of his his kind of his his malaise mm -hmm. is when the vampires in Dracula's own court go around him or contradict him or do anything to get in the way of, of what he wants. Those are the only moments that he really perks up in the first in this first portion of the season is when mm -hmm. he's being specifically opposed in a way that Trevor and Sypha can't really do because they're just they're just obstacles, but the people who are disagreeing with him strike a much more acute nerve. Yeah, and narratively speaking, uh, there's a couple reasons why Dracula would react exclusively to Alucard, which is, you know, that is his son. He did like maim him pretty badly. He probably feels bad about that on some level. Um, <laughs> And uh, you can just tell that he does not want to face Alucard. Uh, he doesn't want yeah. to deal with him. Um, it's not that he, he doesn't like hate him. You know, if he hated anyone, it would probably be the Belmonts. Uh, but he doesn't really react to that with anything more than just like, all right, whatever, let's get on with the killing all of humanity and we'll deal with that if and when it becomes an issue. <laughs> Uh, and other <laughs> yeah. members of the court are more dismissive. Isaac, for instance, is completely dismissive of Alucard. He calls him a spoiled child, which kind of shows that Isaac is really not on the same wavelength as Dracula. He doesn't no. really get how Dracula thinks and what he considers as important, because Isaac is like, Psh, yeah, whatever, your, your, your half-human son is on the way here, whatever, he's, he's probably not even an issue, and Dracula's like, oh, that's so not the problem. <laughs> Um, but uh, as the season moves on, we see a little bit more of this, but basically whenever we cut back to Dracula, he's either, you know, in the chair being sad, or he's talking to Isaac, or he's trying to, you know, control his vampire lieutenants that are all starting to realize there's a fundamental problem with Dracula's plan, which is if they kill all of humanity, they are all going to starve to death. And Dracula doesn't seem 
to want to talk about this. When when I think Godbrand brings it up, we get a little glimpse of the, the true motherfucking Dracula when he stands up and fully menaces him. And it's awesome. Yeah. And Godbrand literally runs out of the room. Little Godbrand. <laughs> yeah, little Godbrand. And the fact is, he's not incorrect. And Dracula is only holding this together through sheer force of charisma. And like, he is so diminished at this point. And he can still terrify all these vampire lords into submission because he's mm -hmm. motherfucking Dracula. But we haven't had a chance to see him that way. We get a flashback at one point when he's, uh, I think he's talking to Isaac about it. Uh, he's talking to Isaac. He's yeah. talking about how he used to relish the details and really the drama of being Dracula. Yeah, yeah. But now he's so depressed that, uh, that the tactics don't interest him. He just needs everybody dead. The, 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 the subjects and the, the task at hand is so impossibly large that it's impossible to, to keep all of the details organized and the the specificity that he was able to, to act on before when, you know, 40 merchants in this town wronged him, so he killed all 40 of them, uh, and, you know, stuck their heads on pikes, classic Dracula shit. Mm -hmm. that, that's all gone because the thought of exterminating the entire human race is so incomprehensibly big that there's there's no room for charisma, there's no room for show in that it's, it's only a task. Yeah. And it's a task that he's getting pretty tired of. It's not like he'll be like, ah, you know what, we can kill humanity later. No, he does, he's still motivated by the death of Lisa, but now it's just like this, this burning, just white hot nugget that's just hurting him. That's just like burning him up to keep itself going, which is very sad. He's described by, uh, I think Hector, as embers of his former self. Like, yeah. they're all talking about how Dracula, oh man, he used to be so, so cool he used to be so dracula but now it's just like we're seeing the wreck of a former former incredible thing and uh yeah. so that's what we're seeing from dracula and it's interesting that we are constantly cutting back to dracula because for most of the season we are following trevor sypha and alucard on their way to yes. the castle and to to get powered up so that they can ground the castle and uh kill dracula like they're they're prepping for the fight they're the heroes we probably should be following them but we are constantly aware of what Dracula is doing, feeling, and thinking, which essentially produces this dramatic irony where we have more information than any of the individual characters in the series. And uh, as we build up to the final confrontation, the tone gets fairly morose, which is good. That's a good tone for this, but it's unexpected. It's our heroes going to kill Dracula. How is that not the most heroic, triumphant thing? But. One thing they don't shy away from is that Dracula is Alucard's father. He was a good father. He raised him well with Lisa. Alucard doesn't like that he has to kill him. Yeah, he he outright says when when Trevor asks, "Are you ready?" Alucard says, "No," but you know, let's get it over with. Yeah. Uh, it's it, Alucard is clearly extremely conflicted by this, uh, and you know he he obviously gets a, a great many traits from uh, from his father, and clinical depression is apparently one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that I think we can't overlook is that Alucard is at most like 19 in this show. He looks like a grown adult because he matures very quickly, but like, if you look at the numbers, he can't be anywhere near emotionally mature enough to handle having yeah. to kill his own father to save the world. And like, exactly. the thing is, this whole thing, this whole operation is his idea. Like, Trevor is content to just kind of keep helping individual people. Uh, Sypha is just kind of generally heroic. Alucard is the one who's like, if we want this to stop, we have to go murder my father. I don't like yeah. it. I'm not a fan of this plan. We have to do it anyway. Oh man, yeah. he's a genius. He's been around for centuries. We're going to be losing knowledge that humanity could have benefited from, but unfortunately we have to kill him. And it's like, I get it. You're conflicted, but you are correct. We do have to kill him. <laughs> and uh, so that's kind of a through line. And it sort of slides into the center of the focus as they ground Dracula's castle, very slowly ride up an ice elevator into the red moonlight to get there, and uh, prepare to kick some ass. And again, the, the dissonance that we've been seeing all through the show between Dracula as, you know, the villain at the other end of the massive army, and Dracula as this sad guy alone in his house because his wife is dead and his son is, you know, well, that's fine. Uh, it, yeah. it kind of comes through here because our heroes kick ass, and it's heroic and cool and they're playing like an orchestral remix of bloody tears the iconic castlevania theme and like everyone watching it is like yeah and then when they get through all the minions and they go to fight dracula it's like oh wait this is sad again but then yeah. then we get dracula 
Well, there's a visual hint that Dracula is maybe, once again, the motherfucking Dracula we've heard so much about, uh, and that his eyes fully go blood red, and so does the moon. Yes. Not sure how he did that, but it was really cool. You can tell this boy is angry now. Oh, he's an angry boy. When Dracula recognizes, okay, I've been betrayed, I can't, uh, you can't even get good staff to help you kill humanity these days, whatever. <laughs> he goes full Dracula, basically, with one caveat. Uh, he saves Isaac first. Isaac is like, I am prepared to lay down my life for you, and Dracula's like, mm, we're not doing that, and he chucks him through a transmission mirror to save him. So Isaac basically ends up in the middle of the Sahara. So, you know, saved his relative. Dracula prepares to fight. And basically, the minute the heroes arrive, he is Dracula. He's like proper Dracula. Uh, Alucard walks in and I believe he says, I think their first words to each other are, Alucard says, father, and Dracula says, son. And then they have a uh, an ideological argument over whether or not this is what Lisa would have wanted. Alucard says, this stops in the name of my mother, and mm. Dracula says, it endures in the name of your mother. Yeah. So the fundamental disconnect uh, between how both of them perceive it is manifested uh, in the fact that Alucard is here, and he is really the only person who can philosophically show, just by his existence, why Dracula is wrong in this, and that mm -hmm. thought is infuriating to him. Yeah, and it's important to note that we are seeing emotions from Dracula in this fight that we haven't seen since he destroyed Targavishta. Like, he's, no. he's like, smirking and snarling, and yeah, it's all the classic pure evil Disney villain stuff. It's, it's what we want from Dracula, you know? He's, he's angry, he's frustrated, he's, you know, confident and and smirking and dismissive of the heroes like all that good villain stuff and of course the heroes you know come in prepare to fight uh and it goes very badly for them <laughs> um because yes. even though there's three of them even though one of them is a powerful mage even though one of them is an incredibly well-trained vampire hunter even though one of them is fucking alucard who we have at this point never seen even slightly ruffled in a fight like we we've seen how competent these guys are we've seen them fight together like Dracula is the first thing we've seen that they have had to, like, break a sweat against. And that yeah. is indicative all on its own. But Dracula's attitude is just so perfect in this scene. Like, we know his motivation. We realize what's going on here. But we also know why the nuances and the sympathies of his motivation don't matter right now. This is just the knockdown dragout drag-out fight that everything's been building towards of basically, are we going to kill all of humanity in the name of my mother, or are we going to save humanity in the name of my mother? And that is... Oh, so that that lets Dracula drop the sympathetic stuff. That lets us not focus on, oh, you know, he cares, he's got friends, he's sad, he's depressed. That just lets him be like, all right, let's put all that on the shelf. Right now, we are killing some people. And he's really in his element. And uh, this fight has a lot of really good Dracula moments. But again, it's made more powerful because we know Dracula as a person now. He's been humanized for us since basically the very beginning of the show. Like... We, we sympathize with him. We know he's bad and that killing all of humanity is bad, but we recognize what he's going through. We, we, we see yeah. the person behind mother fucking Dracula. And we've also seen how even relatively minor displays of power earlier in the season have absolutely exhausted him. Like when we were talking about how Dracula stands up to Godbrand, after that scene, he collapses into his chair completely wiped. Yet here, at, you know, 1% of his theoretical power level, he is basically wiping the floor with the protagonist. Yeah. So it is terrifying how powerful this character is when the presence of his son makes him so furious that every single emotion he was holding on to earlier is just, you know, right out the back of his head. And the only thing that's on his mind is being Dracula and just being a machine of death. And what's interesting is that, uh, Dracula and Alucard, of course, their dynamic is very loaded and complicated. When they're having that little ideological argument, like, you can feel the emotions are boiling just under the surface. Trevor and Sypha, th Dracula's in his element. It's just, oh, a couple, uh, a couple monster killers come to try and take out old Dracula? All right, let's do this. The, and, like, he, you know, he knows about Belmonts. He acknowledges them. He doesn't think they can kill him all that much. Uh, but <laughs> there's a great scene, just a, oh, the perfect part of this scene. 
because uh, when, of course, when the fight starts, uh, Alucard attacks. Alucard is very fast. Alucard hits first. Dracula catches his sword and starts pushing him back with three fingers, and we're like, uh-oh, we might be in trouble. <laughs> um, yeah. Because, like, Alucard is by he's stronger, faster, tougher. He's got all these magic powers. Everyone else in the team is basically just a regular human with some unusual skills. So it's like, uh-oh, uh-oh, they got Worf. What are we going to do? <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I think... The, that, so that's the first sign that, uh-oh, this might be bad. I believe the second sign is that Sypha chucks some, I think it's a fireball or something at him, and Dracula closes the distance between them and, like, actually injures her for the first time in the show. So that's another sign where it's like, oh, no, things might be bad. Trevor takes this as his sign to try, <laughs> and he runs up and punches <laughs> Dracula in the face, <laughs> and this doesn't do it. Like, Dracula doesn't even move. He just slowly turns, and he says, You must be the Belmont. To Trevor's credit, he tries punching him one more time before Dracula <laughs> punches to get him. In. Yeah, and, and then Dracula punches him hard enough to drop him instantly. And we're like, okay, so basically, Trevor and Sypha are on. Let's try and survive. Because, like, the minute Trevor's down, Dracula's not like, I'll deal with you later. No, he goes to immediately kill him. The only reason Trevor survives is that Alucard and Sypha both work very hard to keep Dracula back until Trevor can get up. When he sees Belmont and says he must be Belmont, he realizes that, oh, now he just gets to play with his food a little mm -hmm. bit here. He's just having a blast, and you can hear him perk up over the course of a line when he realizes, oh, now I'm in for a treat today. Uh -huh. Where, you know, the, the the anger from before that shot him into this, to this big dramatic, you know, energy in this fight, that... Again, that even goes in the shelf a little bit, where now he's just excited. That he's so single-minded now, whether it's being sad, being angry, or in this case, you know, the joy of the drama, that mm -hmm. he's just all about it. And he's, he's a little caught off guard when he remembers, like, oh, Alucard's here too. Yep. Yeah. That he he completely forgets that, oh, what's this that's going through both of my arms? Oh, that's that's my son's sword. Heck, oh, okay. Oh, right, I forgot he was uh, here. So yeah. <laughs> once he sees Trevor, he just flips another switch and he's like, okay, let's go. There's, yeah, there's... And that is what's what's the core of this scene that, that makes it so fun. That was that was the, the, the catalyst for this entire detailed diatribe yeah. is just that delivery of that one line. When we were discussing like what, what villain to do, I was like, hear me out. You must be the Belmont. And you were like, oh yeah, okay, all right, <laughs> we're good. Yep. Um, there we yeah, go. It's, it's just solid gold. It's so fun. And, you know, there is nothing a proper villain likes more than a proper hero, you know? Like, not because they're like, oh, maybe yeah. you'll be able to defeat me, but like, oh, this is going to be fun. I'll be able to do all kinds of great monologues at this one. So so when he's dealing with Trevor and Sypha, he's in his element. It's like, oh, a couple upstart humans with wacky powers and cool artifacts. All right, let's do this. It's just Alucard yeah. that keeps throwing him off balance. And Alucard is the only one who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, so... Yeah, it, it's also that a Belmont does not philosophically oppose Dracula in the same way. He's just a guy who wants to fight him. Mm -hmm. When when he sees Alucard, he knows, like, okay, my son stands for something philosophically completely the opposite of what I want, using the name of my wife to make that happen, whereas Trevor is just, he's just a Belmont. I would say that uh, there's, there's one ideological difference here that's quite interesting, because... Uh, Trevor, as mentioned, has a very similar perspective to the world on Dracula. Like, you know, he's gotten a little bit more optimistic, but he's still kind of like, I totally get why he's doing it. We just need to stop him. Alucard is the one who's like, his reason for doing it is fundamentally flawed. So like, Trevor is yeah. not the kind of character to be like, is this what your wife would have wanted? He's not going to do that. He's going to try and kill him. He's tr yep. he, he knows how this works. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But Alucard is the one who's trying to talk him down because it's like your fundamental premise is flawed. Lisa wouldn't want this, so you should stop. Uh, and Aluc er, Dracula does not like hearing that. But Trevor doesn't ideologically oppose Dracula in the same way. He's like, I get it, I really do, but this is my job, so all right, let's do this. Um, yeah, that's what makes Trevor easy for Dracula and mm -hmm. fun. <laughs> yeah, easy and fun. It's like a little workout. It's Alucard that keeps making things spicy. And as the yeah. fight progresses, it becomes pretty clear that Trevor and Sypha, the minute they start closing with Dracula, it's just like, all right, will they be able to survive for like three seconds for long <laughs> enough to Alucard to intercept and save them? Because they're yeah. very squishy and Dracula's not pulling any punches with them. Uh, so after basically the first phase of the fight finishes, after they chew through Dracula's first health bar, um, it basically turns into just Dracula versus Alucard. Uh, and they it kind of turns into a bit of a DBZ punch fight. They start going through some walls, some ceilings, and of course, Sypha and Trevor are not that fast, so they're essentially running to catch up. And this is the part where the fight gets sad again. Yep. 
Alucard is, is like fast and tough enough to not be immediately KO'd by dealing with Dracula, but he is not stronger than Dracula. And uh, no. basically through the fight, it becomes very clear that he's being worn down after a certain point. The only way he can get any hits on Dracula is by doing his like super fast teleport around bouncy thing. Uh, and that doesn't even work for very long. <laughs> No, Dracula it catches him in the middle of his teleport by the face. <laughs> it's like, all right, yep. okay, he's fucking Dracula. I get it. But it's the thing is, like, when fighting Trevor and Sypha, that's toying with them. Fighting Alucard, Dracula's not having fun. And there's a degree to which it's like, all right, we are basically watching a father fight his son full out in their house. <laughs> that's deeply uncomfortable. And it just gets more and more just sad and uncomfortable as it goes on. Um, Dracula at one point kind of mockingly asks Alucard if he's going to stake him. And Alucard says, you want me to? <laughs> and uh, yeah. basically Alucard puts forward his thesis on what's going on, that because Dracula didn't kill him before and almost certainly won't kill him now, he wants this to end as much as Alucard does and describes the whole thing as nothing but history's longest suicide note. Because as we know, Dracula does know that killing all of humanity will lead to all the vampires dying. Like, he doesn't care. Yes. And he says earlier that that's good and it will bring silence, which is what he wants. Mm -hmm. But Alucard is correct. Dracula does want this to end. He just wants it to end with the extinction of humanity. And Dracula does not like hearing this. Uh, I think from this point forward, the fight doesn't really have music in it. It does not. It specifically does not. It cuts out. Right. It's just the sounds of these two, well, I'd say these two fighting, but really it's just the sounds of Dracula basically beating him up, which is, again, just really sad and uncomfortable. And there's no dialogue anymore. All you really hear is Dracula grunting in exertion as he continues to beat up Alucard. Which is, you know, uncomfortable again. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and the turning point comes when they have another little DBZ punch fight and go through another wall and end up in a room that Dracula recognizes. <laughs> as Alucard's childhood bedroom. And it's like, all right, I think maybe he's starting to gain some perspective on what exactly he's doing here. Like, fighting fighting Trevor and Sypha, that's like a day at the spa for Dracula. <laughs> but um, killing his own son in the childhood bedroom he built for him with his beloved wife, that's, uh, that's a bridge too far. And again, yeah. the, the humanity, the sympathy, it all comes slamming back. Like, this is what they've been building up. In the whole two seasons that we've seen Dracula, where we understand his motivation, we we understand that he's not only capable of love, but like basically being killed by it, by how much he feels it. What I actually really like about this is that it is not just because he loved Lisa. It is also because he loves Alucard. Part of what's absolutely breaking his heart is the awareness that this is his son, Alucard. He loves him, you know, he raised him. He made him all these toys. He painted this bedroom for him. He loves him and he's killing him. And it's not just because, oh, you remind me of your mother who I actually love. No, and I, I'm glad that they did this because there's a lot of series where a character will care about another character only because they remind them of the character they really care about. Mm -hmm. And that's generally a bad message. But in this case, it's like, no, no, the problem that Dracula has is that he does love his wife and his son and he cannot possibly bring himself to kill him. And when the fact that he's even considering it makes him kind of look up very hollowly and say, I must already be dead. And yeah. from that point forward, he is fully on board with dying. Like, and yeah. it, it's so, it's hard to watch at this point because like he's not fighting mm -hmm. back. Alucard breaks off one of his bedposts to use as a stake. And it's like, oh, the symbolism, oh, the trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and when he goes to stake Dracula, like Dracula helps him along the way. And then as he's sort of, you know, burning and dissolving and like the flesh is sloughing off. He's like reaching out to Alucard with his like horrifying rotting claw hands, like he's trying to hug him. And of course that's when Trevor and Sypha show up and they're like, oh no, Dracula's menacing our friend and they cut off his head and burn him. And it's like, ooh, <laughs> Alucard will be talking about this in therapy when it's invented in 400 years. Um, yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a really hard scene. And I think the, the, the combination of, of realizing that Dracula not only lost his wife, but is now driving away his son by way of fighting, that he is he is pushed off both of them, uh, is is the, the the double whammy that that really does it. And of course, obviously the the the, the visual juxtaposition of, of the, the the broken room serving as the representation of the broken family. Yeah. Uh, it all just it it all hits all at once, and Dracula realizes that uh, despite, you know, 
all of his various efforts to, to reach out and make bridges with, with people like Isaac, he has absolutely nothing left. Yeah. Uh, and, and Alucard makes that abundantly clear when, when he explains to Trevor and Sypha that Dracula died a long time ago. Yeah. So it this this whole thing that, that we were going towards, uh, you know, in the end we share Alucard's perspective that's very somber about this. Like there's no there's no joy in this. Uh, it's it's not like we feel like Dracula and it's like, haha, we have bested you. It's like mm-hmm. no, this is this is sad. And uh, even Trevor and Sypha, for whom Dracula was just the big scary bad guy on the other end of the army of minions, they get it. Like, they, they see mm-hmm. that this is tragic and sad. Admittedly, Trevor is kind of like, hey, you saved all of humanity and he was going to kill everyone. Don't get all weepy about killing your own dad. And meanwhile, Sypha's like, but it's totally okay to mourn the man he was, as well as be like, all right, we had to do it and we saved the world and all that because, you know, that's how grief works, Trevor. Um, which is good, you know, like, even at the end, they are really kind of leaning into, this was a, this was an emotionally complicated endeavor. Like, yeah, it was, we're fighting Dracula, the ideal pure evil villain, but also, that's his dad, and this didn't have to happen, and this is a tragedy. It's, it's, it's these people where things could have worked out well for them if Lisa hadn't been killed, everything would have been, probably been fine, uh, she was, like, working on turning Dracula into a better person, teaching him how humanity worked so he could, like, walk among them and, and not be so distant and, and dismissive of them. And if she'd and she had... she clearly made a lot of progress with she that. She had, yeah. No, she had. Uh, and that... That just makes the whole thing really sad because this didn't have to happen, but circumstances made it so that it did have to happen. And all that we're left with in the end is a big empty castle and Alucard and his two dead parents. And it's like... Yep. Oh boy, and then there's two more seasons of the show, <laughs> so like, yeah. they don't shy away from dealing with the emotional consequences of that either. Um, no. The the nice thing though, cutting way ahead to the very end of, uh, yes. uh, of season four, uh, <laughs> through through mystical shenanigans, uh, we, we get the ending that Dracula and Lisa kind of just appear uh, and are like, how did that happen? I don't know. Uh, you, you want to go way the hell north to the farthest reaches of Scotland and camp out there and be the inspiration for Bram Stoker's novel in 300 years? Uh, it, it's, it's good because you, you see that the man who loved Lisa is still there even after having gone through everything. And that all the times that we see Dracula and Lisa in hell in, uh, in, in seasons three and four, all they're doing is just sitting there embracing each other. Yep. And it's it's so sad that even the implication of like, you know, like weeks and months and, and, and years afterwards, they're just they're just having this embrace, feeling so sorry for, for each other and for everything that happened. It really is a tragedy on every single level. Yeah. And it, it's why the scene is 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 so good that you have this character who is clearly such a villain, such a, a bad person on the surface that develops such a capacity for love and compassion that seeing these these levers get pulled and this this roller coaster go so far up and down is just so exhausting. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's so well done on the, on the part of the the creators and the the characterization. Um, it's it's really what what makes this show so special. Yeah. Uh, and not just why this is such uh, uh, a a villainous scene, but um, <laughs> such a villainous show because Castlevania is very much defined by the role the villains play. Even you know aside from Dracula even after Dracula, what the villains are up to is just as important as what the protagonists are up to. Mm-hmm. And in many cases, the line between villains and protagonists gets a little bit weird. And yep. the show does a very good job of often putting you in a position of sympathy for characters who are outright villainous uh, at almost every turn. It's so impressive. Yeah, one thing I really like about this show is that every character is... A character, you know? Like, they've got their own stuff going on, their own motivations. You always sort of get it. It's not that you think they're right, it's that you get why they're like that. They don't shy away from showing the humanity of a character just because they are an inhuman creature of the night, etc, etc. So that, uh, all of that to say that uh, this, this one villainous scene with the Battle of Dracula's Castle and all of the other ones uh, are, are what make Castlevania so special and what makes it a, a wonderful addition to uh, this little little collaboration that we got going on here. So yeah. thank you to, uh, to our buddy Nando for organizing this. Uh, if you liked this video, please check out the rest of the videos in the playlist. And if you want to give this a spin for yourself, make a video on one villainous scene and shoot Nando an email and he'll throw it in the playlist. Yeah. So 
I don't know, Red, uh, anything else we've, uh, any other bases we missed? <laughs> I mean, unless you want my 50-minute rant about why Dracula and Trevor's foil relationship is really interesting, uh, I think that's all I got for today, so, uh, bye! <laughs>